Hello to all of my international lovelies and American night owls. Nice to have you with me. I'm Tad. I'm going to be here doing stuff um, until, well, it's one o'clock now. And this is one of those rare nights of the year where I'm going to be here from one o'clock in the morning until one o'clock in the morning. Because I don't know about the rest of you, but it's daylight savings time here tonight, I think. I think. Well, I'll, I'll know because since half the clocks or more now are automated with, you know, computer and phone and all that, they'll change by themselves. Um, if, and then I'll go around, if, if I'm in fact correct, and it is daylight savings, I will go around and uh, fix the manual clocks, the ones that do not automatically update, because that's my job. I am a dad. And I have to do things like that. Make sure the door's locked. Make sure the dogs get out to pee before bedtime. Make sure the clocks are right. You know, stuff like that. Dad stuff. I didn't know this when I was younger. I didn't understand the, the mysteries of dadhood. And in fact, there are still mysteries of dadhood that are still a mystery to me. Um, car maintenance is one of them. Fortunately... In this modern age, you can just go to somebody else and say, here, fix my car. Here's money. Um, although it's more expensive than if you do it yourself. But tragically, my, my dad could never teach me to be interested in car maintenance. Um, however, I discovered something I'm very good at in terms of cars today. Yesterday, actually. Um, my car is now so bashed up by having been used as the training car for... Um, Two of the kids driving and uh, learning to drive, and also it was, the door was kicked in by a, a, a juvenile delinquent cyclist, which is a long story. And then various other times, people have either backed it into things, or uh, the other day, Deb got in an accident, which was not her fault, but she felt really sorry for the kid, and since our car was just slightly crumpled and his was much more crumpled, she declined to <laughs> report it and stuff like that. So my poor car is just like a mess. It is the ugliest thing you've ever seen. I mean, I'm not a car person. You know, I'm not one of those people, um, as is very common Californians, whose sense of self-worth is wrapped up in their car. And thank God for that, because I have the most ugly, battered looking. <laughs> it's not that old. I mean, it's like a 2014 or something, but it's just beat all to hell. I mean, it's really tragic. So because Deborah was going to drive over the hill to today and I had to drive over the hill yesterday, which is, you know, freeway through the mountains and curvy and all that stuff. And, you know, I always want to make sure it's in good shape. And the last bashing had literally separated two of the kind of, you know, plastic trim things around the sides of the wheel wells and loosened up the, 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 the undercarriage in front and all this stuff. I literally had to go out yesterday and tape my car back together with duct tape or to be more precise, Gorilla Tape, which is the brand name of this particular type of tape. Um, and I did a damn good job, I have to say. I mean, it's I drove it over the hill yesterday. It's it, Everything is perfectly in place. There was no <laughs> unnecessary wind whistling through the undercarriage or anything like that. But I've just, you know, it's like the, 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 the contrast with the glamorous life of the internationally known writer is, <laughs> it, you know, it, it amuses me sometimes. I, it's so funny because... I think a lot of people assume that, you know, if you've been writing for a long time and you've got books in print and you've sold many copies over the years and all that, that like you're rich, um, it is so far from the case. And, uh, you know, so there I am out there on my hands and knees crawling around the car yesterday in the morning before driving over the hill. Um, and <laughs> I'm applying duct tape to hold my car together and just thinking like, wow. You know, where's lifestyles of the rich and famous? And they really need, you know, some contrast or, or MTV's cribs. <laughs> Here's world famous author Tad Williams duct taping his car back together. Anyway, um, so that's what's going on around my world right at the moment. Um, other stuff is basically good. Um, you know, obviously things are things um you know we're still dealing with stuff and family stuff and you know the 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 
the ongoing thing of having having lost somebody very dear to all of us. But otherwise, I'm doing okay, and we got some good news on the house front in terms of what we're doing with the house. So that that's a very good thing. That has given us a little breathing room. Uh, it's not going to get me a new car, <laughs> unfortunately, but it'll buy me some more duct tape so I can keep this one going. Um, what else? Uh, Deb is gone tonight. We're, as, I, as I've mentioned in the past, we're alternating back and forth um, over the hill. And uh, so poor John is upstairs by himself at the moment because everybody else in the household has gone to sleep, including the other dog. And so poor John is lying on his beanbag chair in the middle of the living room. Every time I walk past, he's rolling his eyes at me. Johnny does whale eyes. I don't know if you've ever seen um, whales up close, but, you know, like they, they, of course, they have huge eyes because they're huge animals. And their eyes look very mournful, though. There's something about their eyes and the way their lids are or something. They look very mournful. And that's Johnny. He just lies there on his side when he's trying to let you know that he's not happy. And he watches you when you go past. And his eyes kind of follow you, but in this really Eeyore-ish way. Like, I know you're not going to stop and do anything with me. And you're doing important things. So I'll just lie here and watch you go. But don't let me stop you. You know, he's got that whole attitude down. So he's feeling sorry for himself, but I'll be upstairs after we finish here, and uh, <laughs> he will he will come and sit on top of me, um, which is how he makes sure he knows where I am once I've settled for the evening. He'll come and stick his large dog booty up against me, and um, then he kind of stretches out on the bed and gets comfortable, but he likes to have part of himself jammed up against me, and if Deb's in the bed also, when he comes in like that, then he'll... He'll like jam his butt up against one of us and do an eye beam between the two of us and put his paws on the other one to make sure that nobody's going anywhere without him knowing. He's a very insecure dog. Bless him. Um, anyway, so what else is there to tell you guys about? Not really much. I'm 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 actually almost finished with the book. Um, I'm you know I I pretty much write every day unless there's some reason I can't. And those are days that, that burn my soul if I can't write. I feel like, I mean, you know, unless there's, a, obviously if, I, if I'm not ready to, I can at least, as I've said before, I understand that's part of the process so I can live with that, although it's frustrating because you can't move the manuscript forward. Um, but most days I am either writing or I'm thinking about what I'm gonna write. Um, that's pretty much every day actually. And I actually got work done today, despite having driven over the hill and had various other distractions, but I managed to get some work done. So I'm in a good mood about that. And as I said, I'm coming down to the last um, kind of uh, wheezing. It's like one of those marathon runners, you know, and everybody else finished an hour ago and this guy is still <laughs> just grinding on, you know, and he like looks like death and he's limping, and, you know, and there's a few people standing around, probably his family, you know, going, come on, Carl, you can do it. And Carl's like, what the hell was I thinking? That's me at the end of this book. But I'm, it's, it's, I hope it's going to be. I hope it's going to be worth it. I think it will. I always do, um, and certainly there's going to be a lot of stuff that people wanted to find out about that they're going to find out about. So um, I'm coming in. I'm coming coming in for a landing. Um, I'm going to see if I can stick it to mix a metaphor because obviously when you're talking about a landing like that, you're usually talking about a plane. But when you're talking about sticking the landing, you're usually talking about gymnastics. But let the metaphors mix. What the hell? I don't care. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in and say hello to all of my international lovelies and American night owls who may be with me tonight. And then um, I will read some more from the Dragon Bone Chair. So let me check in and see who's here. Wouter, good evening, good evening. Checking in. Lovely to see you from a sunny and confused time zone. Winter time has started. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I know. Well, the weather's just plain weird, guys. But Al Gore tried to warn us. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, most of you non-Americans understand that reference. Anyway, uh, Becky, hello. Good to see you. And Kristen, hello, hello. Good to see you, too. Suzanne, had to Google the time to make sure. Yeah, I th I'm pretty sure that it does switch over tonight. Sarah, hello, hello. 
And so is Jaloy a Tanuka Daya? I don't think that's giving anything away to say yes. Um, I believe it's even mentioned in the first trilogy. Um, but certainly it is... Yeah, because she's referred to as Ruyin's own, even in the first set of books. So I think that it was pretty much uh, that cat was out of the old bag um, back during Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. So yes, Jaloy is a Tanuka Daya. Uh, Penny, hello, good to see you. Christy, good morning. Isaac, good super early morning. Yes, indeed. Well, that, that is the part of the world that you are in there in Utah. Um, you guys have mornings earlier than we do here on the West Coast. And it's just as well. It's just as well, because I can handle this part of the morning. Um, but if it gets later on into the morning, then it's not really so good because my brain stops working. Um, actually, my brain stopped working sometime in the late 90s, but that's okay. Uh, Wouter, I already said hello to Wouter. Who else have I not said hello to yet? See, this is what happens. I look away and then the, the chat feed scrolls up without me. Um, 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 where are we? Okay, got that one, got that one. Mark, good morning. Sarah does, wants to know if they have daylight savings time in Ostinard. No, I don't think so. Um, I suspect not because there is very little centralized government. And in fact, they probably don't understand how the rotation of the Earth and the orbit around the sun work exactly. So um, remember, it took hundreds and hundreds of years just to figure out the calendar issues in Western Europe. So Ostenard is, uh, you know, sort of relatively cognate with about 14th century Western Europe. Uh, at least the human parts of it are. Petra, good morning, good morning. Anamika, and to you as well. Vintertide, Vintertide. Actually, my Dutch is terrible, so I'm just guessing at that. Vintertide has come, but it feels like summer. Yes, so I gather. Uh, Suzanne says, gray and damp in Yorkshire, but a chance of sunlight. There's always a chance of sunlight. Remember, remember folks, there's always a chance of sunlight. Uh, is California making DST permanent? Kristen wants to know. Um, here's what happened, Kristen. They passed the law in the Senate, I believe, in America. This is, so this will be, this will be national. This will be federal. They passed a law abandoning daylight savings time in the Senate, but the House hasn't voted on it yet, although they're expected to pass it also. But then once they do, it still won't take place until sometime in 2023. Probably not. I mean, it'll go back to daylight savings time in spring, and I think they're going to permanently install daylight savings time. So what will happen is in a year from now, in the fall of 2023 in the United States, the daylight savings time will stay and it will not fall back in the fall as we do now, as we're going to do tonight. So that, that's if they pass it, but it's supposedly they're going, you know, the other body that hasn't passed it yet is going to pass it, but then it'll, it won't take place till the next calendar year. And because it's institutionalizing daylight savings time, <clears throat> not standard time. It won't happen until the fall. Okay, anything else I want to check in here? Baking is a mystery of momhood that Becky says she can't puzzle out, but she's very handy with a drill. Excellent. My ex-mother-in-law, not my current and much beloved mother-in-law, but the mother of my first wife, um, was the one in the family that did all the handy work around the household, all the drilling, hammering, and nailing. So I have much experience with that. Um, I have to be the dad in my household, um, but it's not by choice. I did not get up and say, let me handle this. I have a Y chromosome. Um, no, it's more like things just fall apart and nobody does anything until eventually I say, well, for God's sake, and then I go and hammer it back together or <laughs> put a light bulb in it or you know whatever has to be done. It's more desperation. It's more the fact that there, uh, there have been times, I swear to God, this is true. There have been times where I have, in the most deliberate and petty way, when a light has gone out, 
a simple bulb, you know, that anybody in the household could replace. And there's like bulbs in the cabinet. It, it, it ain't hard. And I have deliberately not replaced the bulb just to see if anybody else would. And literally when there were six of us in the house, including four able-bodied young people, there was one of the lights went out, one of the overhead kitchen lights, a very important light over the sink, I think it was. And it was like three weeks went by. It was approaching a month and nobody paid any attention to it. They just washed dishes in the dark. You know, it's like, and I finally, they, you know, they, they broke me. This has happened to me before with my kids. I, I have learned this lesson that you cannot out patient stubborn young people. And especially when they're not even aware of their being stubborn. It just doesn't work. You cannot guilt people into being doing something that they're not even aware needs to be done. So, you know, I wound up replacing that light bulb and nobody said a thing. You know, it was like, wow, the miracle of nature. One day there was no light and now we have light. Isn't evolution wonderful or whatever it was they thought had happened? I don't know. Anyway, um, so Jeremy, hello, good to see you. Um, pleasure. I, all dressed up, at least you were. Oh, yes, I see. Yes, you look, my God, you look like one of the usual, usual suspects. Are you Kaiser Soze? Tell the truth now. Debbie, darn daylight, daylight savings time, says Debbie. It's 8 a.m. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. 8 a.m. is a grisly time of the day, no matter where you are. Sherry, hello, long time no see. Good to have you with us. Voucher and wants to know more about the delinquent cyclist. It was just this... You can tell this was like a young man of about early 20s. I'm going to make this quick because I know people are waiting for me to read. Young man, probably in his early 20s, we had a stop sign. I was driving with uh, one of our young people in the car. And um, this guy on a bicycle ran a stop sign and then got angry with me because I almost hit him um, because he ran a stop sign. I didn't see him. You know, he just came zooming downhill and rolled out in front of me just as I was starting forward. And then he started screaming at me and I got out of the car and, you know, with the idea that, you know, okay, there's one of my, my young people, one of our young wards is here. I don't want to give a bad example. So instead of getting into a fist fight with this young idiot who was looked like the kind of guy who was riding a bicycle because he'd had his license taken away, you know, he had that kind of a look somebody he did not look like an upstanding citizen anyway he got really angry with me because i was basically pointing out to him that you know you ran the stop sign i didn't really have any urge to hit you or kill you that's not my idea of fun at all and um he got back on his bike and rode up alongside me and kicked the side of my door as hard as he could the passenger side dented it in and sped off on his bike and I went so what am I going to do I'm going to chase this stupid 22 year old idiot down and what you know like try and force him to give me his license number so I can sue him or I'm you know what was I going to do so I just left it but I should have probably done something about it so I still have a dent in my car door but there's so many other dents and scratches on that poor car and it's now held together with gorilla tape so what you gonna do? Um, anyway, Jessica. Yes, hello. Jessica thinks of them as seal eyes. Oh, when we was talking about Johnny's eyes before. Yes, that that's a good one too. Uh, Tracy, greetings, Tracy. Good to see you. Who else? Kristen, Kristen, Kristen has many things to say. It's never before Halloween here. Oh, meaning daylight savings. Okay, I was gonna say yeah, it's before Halloween right now. Um, I see. It's never before Halloween. Um, Susan, hello, good morning from North Carolina. Yes, Al tried. He did try, didn't he? Um, and who else is there? Last one, Ivan. Hello, Ivan. There's Ivan, my dear friend, who I have not seen in person for, oh, God, well, probably pre, pre-pandemic, Ivan, I think. Anyway, Ivan is a wonderful guy. We used to play music together back in the day and we hung together and we had many adventures all over the Bay Area with the rest of our friends. And it's always a pleasure to see Ivan, who is one of the one of nature's gentlemen. Anyway, um, so thank you all for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you as always. Ivan says yes. 
<laughs> yes, we did. We had many adventures. And uh, we survived, astonishingly. We survived. Um, <clears throat> and Walter says, Dirk says hi. Well, hello, Dirk. Which Dirk? Dirk Nowitzki? I didn't know Dirk was a big fan of mine. Um, anyway, I, that's... I'm the only other Dirk I can think of is Dirk Dirksen, the guy who, you, which Ivan would remember because Ivan was there with us. Dirk Dirksen was the guy who ran the Mabuhai Garden back when it was a punk club in San Francisco in the 70s. And someday, not tonight because I am going to read, someday I will tell you a wonderful story about the Fatu show at the Mabuhai Garden. So mark that down on your calendar. That's Fatu, F-A-T-U. And I will tell you the wonderful story of Fatu at the Mabuhai Gardens. But not tonight. Tonight I'm going to read. Um, which I had promised, of course. Because that's why I'm here, theoretically. Although I wind up spending more and more time just babbling about all the crap that I'm doing. So, the last thing you may remember, or not remember, depending on if you've heard the last thrilling episode or not, was that Simon and Binibic and the mysterious Malachias and the injured young girl Lelith have escaped from the hounds, the horrible, horrible hounds, and have uh, lodged themselves with the wise woman Jaloy on her strange house on the lake. And Jaloy has essentially tried a bit of an experiment with Simon to encourage him because of the dreams he's had, to try to have a, a sort of a vision. And he has had a vision, and that vision was of something very frightening, which is a huge icy mountain in the far north and a queen with a silver mask. And um, at the last moment, he was saved in this dream or this vision by the appearance of an owl who came and caught him just before these horrible things in the mountain got hold of him, or at least psychically got hold of him, or however you want to phrase it, and brought him back, and he woke, he, he returned to uh, normal life, I guess, for lack of a better term. Anyway, so I'm going to continue from that point, because it's a new section. Simon groaned and rolled over onto his side. His head was pounding like Reuben the Bear's anvil during tournament time. His tongue seemed swollen to twice its normal size. The air he breathed tasted of metal. He pulled himself into a crouch, moving his heavy head as slowly as possible. Binibic was lying nearby, his wide face pale. Kantaka nosed at the troll side, whimpering. Across the smoking fireplace, dark-haired Malachias was shaking Jaloy, whose mouth hung slack, her lips gleaming wetly. Simon groaned again as his head throbbed, hanging down between his shoulders like a bruised fruit. He crawled to Binibic. The little man was breathing. Even as Simon leaned over him, the troll began to cough, gasped for air, and opened his eyes. We, he rasped, we are all here. Simon nodded, looking over to Jaloy, still motionless despite Malachias' attention. A moment, he said, and slowly got to his feet. He walked gingerly out the hut's front door, carrying a small, empty pot. He was faintly surprised to see that, despite the pall of fog, it was still full afternoon. The time on the dream road had seemed much longer than that. He also had the nagging feeling that something else had changed outside the cottage, but could not put his finger on what the difference was. The view seemed slightly off. He decided it must be some effect of the experience. After filling the pot with lake water and washing the sticky green paste from his hands, he returned to the house. Binibic drank thirstily, then gestured that Simon should take the container to Jaloy. Malachias watched, half hopeful, half jealous, as Simon carefully took the witch woman's jaw in one hand and splashed a little water into her open mouth. She coughed, then swallowed, and Simon gave her a little more. As he held her head, Simon was suddenly aware that, in some way, Jaloy had saved him while they were all walking in dream. 
As he looked down at the woman, who was breathing more regularly now, he remembered the gray owl who had caught him up when his dream self had been at its final gasp and had borne him away. Jaloy and the troll had not expected quite such a circumstance, he sensed. In fact, it was Simon who had put them in such danger. For once, though, he had no feeling of shame over his actions. He had done what needed doing. He had been fleeing the wheel long enough. How is she? Benedict asked. I think she will be well, Simon replied, looking at the witch woman carefully. She saved me, didn't she? Benedict stared for a moment. His hair hung in sweaty spikes on his brown forehead. It is likely that she did, he said finally. She is a powerful ally, but even her strength has been taxed by this, taxed to the limit. What did it mean? Simon asked now, releasing Jaloy to the supporting arms of Malachias. Did you see what I saw? The mountain and, and the lady with the mask and the book? I wonder if we saw all things the same, Simon. Benedict answered slowly. But I am thinking it is important we wait until Jeloy can share her thoughts with us. Perhaps later, when we have eaten. I am full of terrible hunger. Simon gave the troll a shaky half-smile and turned to find Malachiah staring at him. The boy started to turn away, then seemed to find some internal resolution and held his stare until it was Simon who began to feel uncomfortable. It was as if the whole house was shaking, Malachi said abruptly, starting, startling Simon more than a little. The boy's voice was strained, high-pitched and hoarse. What do you mean? Simon asked, fascinated as much by the fact of Malachi speaking as by what he said. The whole cottage... While you three sat and stared at the fire, the walls began to, to quiver, like someone picked it up and set it down again. Most likely, it was only the way we were moving while we were... I mean, I don't know, Simon gave up in disgust. The truth was, he didn't really know anything right at this moment. His brains felt as though they'd been stirred with a stick. Malachias turned away to give more water to Jaloy. Raindrops suddenly began to patter down onto the windowsill. The gray sky could hold back its burden of storm no longer. The witch woman was grim. They had pushed aside the soup bowls and sat facing each other on the bare floor. Simon, the troll, and the mistress of the cottage. Malachias, although obviously interested, remained on the bed beside the little girl. I saw evil things moving, Jaloy said, and her eyes flashed. Evil things that will shake the roots of the world we know. She had recovered her strength and something else. She was solemn and grave as a king in judgment. I almost wish we had not taken the dream path. But that is an idle wish from the part of me that wants just to be left alone. I see darker days coming, and I fear to be drawn in by events so ill-omened. What do you mean? Simon asked. What, what was all that? Did you see the mountain too? Storm Spike. Minibig's voice was strangely flat. Jaloy looked over at him, nodded then turned back to Simon. True, it was Sturmerspeich we saw, as they call it in Rimmersgard, where it is a legend as far as Rimmersmen are concerned. Stormspike, the mountain of the Norns. We cannot, Benedict said, no Stormspike to be real, but still the Norns have not been intruding on the affairs of Ostenard since Time beyond time. Why now? It, it looked to me as if, as if, as if they were preparing for war, 
Jaloy finished for him. You are right, if the dream is to be trusted. Whether it was true seeing, of course, would take a better trained eye than even mine. But you said the hounds that pursue you wear the brand of Stormspike. That is real evidence in the waking world. I think we can trust this part of the dream, or at least I think we ought to. Preparing for war? Simon was already confused. Against who? And who was the woman in the silver mask? Jaloy looked very tired. The mask, not a woman. A creature out of legend, you could say, or a creature out of time beyond time, as Binibic put it. That was Utuku, the queen of the Norns. Simon felt a chill sweep over him. The wind outside sang a cold and lonely song. But what are these Norns? Binibic said they were Sithi. The old wisdom says that they were part of the Sithi once, Jaloy responded. But they are a lost tribe, or renegades. They never came to Oswa with the rest of their folk, but disappeared into the unmapped north, the icy lands beyond Rimmersgard and its mountains. They chose to separate themselves from the doings of Ostenard, although that seems to be changing. For a moment, Simon saw a flicker of deep unease cross the witch woman's sour, practical face. And these Norns are helping Elias chase me, he thought, feeling panic rise again. Why am I sunk in this nightmare? Then, as if his fright had opened a door in his mind, he remembered something. Unpleasant shapes climbed up from the hidden places in his heart, and he struggled to catch his breath. Those, those pale people, the Norns, I've seen them before. What? Jaloy and the troll spoke at the same time, leaning forward. Simon, startled by their intensity, backed away. When? Jaloy snapped. It happened, I think it happened. It may have been a dream. On the night I ran away from the hayhole, I was in the lich yard, and I thought I heard something calling my name, a woman's voice. I, I was so frightened that I ran away out of the lich yard and toward Fisterborg. There was a stirring on the pallet, Malachias nervously shifting position. Simon ignored him and continued. There was a fire on top of Thisterborg up among the anger stones. Do you know them? I do. Jaloy's response was matter of fact, but Simon sensed some weight behind the words he did not understand. Well, I, I was cold and frightened, so I climbed up. I'm sorry, but I was so sure that this was a dream. Perhaps it is? Perhaps. Go on. There were men on the top, they were soldiers, I, I could tell, because they wore armor. Simon felt a thin sweat break on his palms and rub them together. One of them was King Elias. I was frightened even more then, so I hid. Then there was a horrible creaking noise, and a black wagon came up the far side of the hill. It was coming back, all coming back, or at least it seemed like all, but... There were still empty shadows. Those pale-skinned people, the Norns, that's what they were. They were with it, several of them, dressed in black robes. There was a long pause while Simon struggled to remember. Rain drummed on the cottage roof. And? the Velada asked at last, gently. Alicia, mother of God, Simon swore, and tears started in his eyes. I can't remember. They gave him something, something from the wagon. Other things happened, too, but it feels like it's all under a, a blanket in my head. I can touch it, but I can't tell what it is. They gave him something. I thought it was a dream. 
He buried his face in his hands, trying to squeeze the painful thoughts from his whirling head. Binovic awkwardly patted Simon's knee. This uh, is perhaps answering our other question. I, too, pondered over why the Norns should be readying for battle. I wondered if they would be fighting against Elias, the High King, uh, as some age-old grievance against mankind. Now it has the appearance to me that they are helping him. Some kind of bargain has been struck. Possibly it was being that which Simon saw, but how? How could Elias ever make such compact with the secret of the Norns? Pirates. As soon as Simon said it, he was sure it was true. Morgane said that Pirates opened doors and that terrible things came through. Pirates was on that hill too. Alada Jaloy nodded her head. It makes a kind of sense. A question that must be answered, but one that I am sure is beyond our powers is what was the bargaining tally? What could these two, Pirates and the king, have to offer the Norns? for their aid. They shared a long silence. What did the book say? Simon asked abruptly. On the dream road. Did you see the book too? Binnebick thumped the heel of his hand against his chest. It was there. The runes I saw were of Rimmersgard. Du Svardenvird. In your speech it means the spell of the swords. Or weird of the swords, Jaloy added. It is a famous book in the circles of the wise, but it has been long lost. I have never seen it. It is said to have been written by Nisses, a priest who was a counselor to King Yeldon the Mad. The one Yeldon's tower is named after? Simon asked her. Yes, that is where Yeldon and Nisses both died. Simon considered. I saw three swords, too. Binnebeck looked to Jaloy. Only shapes was I seeing, the troll said slowly. I thought they might have the look of swords. The witch woman had not been sure either. Simon described the silhouettes, but they meant nothing to her or to Binnebeck. So, the little man said at last, we have learned from what? From the dream road. That the Norns are giving aid to Elias? This we guessed. That a strange book is playing some part, perhaps. This is a new thing. We were given a dream glimpse of Stormspike and the halls of the mountain's queen. We may have learned things that we do not understand yet. Still, I am thinking, one thing has changed not at all. We must take ourselves to Naglamund. Valada, your house will be protection for a while, but if Joshua lives, he has need to know of these things. Binnebeck was interrupted from an unexpected quarter. Simon, Malachi said, you said someone called you in the lich yard? It was my voice you heard. I was the one calling you. Simon could only gape. Jaloy smiled. At last, one of our mysteries begins to speak. Go on, child. Tell them what you must. Malachias blushed furiously. I... My name is not... Malachias. It is Maria. But Maria is a girl's name, Simon began, then broke off at the sight of Jaloy's widening grin. A girl? He said lamely. He stared at the strange boy's face and suddenly saw it for what it was. A girl? He grunted, feeling impossibly stupid. The witch woman chuckled. It was obvious, I must say, or it should have been. 
She had the advantage of traveling with a troll and a boy and a cloak of confusing dangerous events, but I told her the deception could not last, especially not all the way to Nagamond, and that is where I must go. Maria rubbed her eyes wearily. I have an important message to bear to Prince Joshua from his niece, Miriamel. Please do not ask me what it is, for I may not tell you. What of your sister? Benedict asked. She will not be able to travel for a long time. He too squinted at the surprising Maria, as if trying to discover how he had been fooled. It did seem obvious now. She is not my sister, Maria said sadly. Lelith was the princess's handmaiden. We were very close. She was frightened to stay in the castle without me and was desperate to come along. She looked down at the sleeping child. I should never have brought her. I tried to pull her up into the tree before the dogs caught us. If only I had been stronger. It is not clear, Jaloy broke in, whether the little girl will ever be able to travel. She has not moved very far from the brink of death. I am sorry to say it, but it is the truth. You must leave her with me. Maria started to protest, but Jaloy would not listen. Simon was disturbed to see what he thought was a glimmer of relief in the girl's dark eyes. It angered him to think she would leave the wounded child behind, no matter how important the message. So, Binnebick said finally, where is it we are now? We still must reach Naglamund, and we are blocked by leagues of forest and the steep slopes of Welldown, not mentioning those who will be in our pursuit, Jaloy thought carefully. It seems to me, she said, that you must get through the forest to Daichikiza. That is an old Sithi place, long deserted, of course. There you can find the stile which is an old road through the hills from a time when the Sithi regularly traveled between there and Aswa, the Hayhold. It is unused now, except by animals, but it will be the easiest, safest place to cross. I can give you a map in the morning. Yes, Dai Chikiza. A deep light kindled in her yellow eyes, and she nodded her head slowly, as if lost in thought. A moment later, she blinked and became her brisk self once more. Now you should sleep. We should all sleep. The day's doings have left me limp as a willow branch. Simon didn't think so. He thought the witch woman looked strong as an oak tree, but he supposed even an oak could suffer in a storm. Later, as he lay curled in his cloak, the warm bulk of Kantaka's somewhat intrusive presence against his legs, he tried to push away thoughts of the terrible mountain. Such things were too vast, too murky. Instead, he wondered what Maria must think of him. A boy, Jaloy had called him, a boy who did not know what a girl looked like. But that was not fair. When had there been time to think about it? And why had she been spying in the hayhold? For the princess, perhaps? And if it had been Maria who called him in the lich yard, why? How had she known his name? Why had she bothered to learn it? He didn't remember ever seeing her at the castle, or at least not as a girl. When he at last floated off into sleep, like a tiny boat pushed out onto a black ocean, he felt as though he pursued a receding light, a patch of brightness just out of reach. Outside the windows, rain covered the dark mirror of Jaloy's lake. Chapter 27. The Gossamer Towers. He tried to ignore the hand on his shoulder, but could not. Opening his eyes, he found the room still quite dark, two angular siftings of stars, the only indication of where the windows stood. Let me sleep, he moaned. It's too early. 
Get up, boy, came the harsh whisper. It was Jaloy, her robe loosely drawn about her. There is no time to waste. Blinking his dry and painful eyes, Simon looked past the kneeling woman to see Binibic quietly repacking his bag. What's going on? he asked, but the troll seemed too busy to talk. I have been outside, Jaloy said. The lake has been discovered, I assume by the men who were hunting you. Simon sat up quickly and reached for his boots. It all seemed so unreal in the near darkness. Nevertheless, he could feel his heart beating swiftly. You sirens, he cursed quietly. What shall we do? Will they attack us? I do not know, Jaloy answered as she left him to go and wake Malachias. No, Maria, Simon reminded himself. There are two camps, one at the lake's far end by the inlet stream, one not far from here. Either they know whose house this is and are trying to decide what to do, or they do not yet know the cottage is here at all. They may have arrived after we put the candles out. A sudden question occurred to him. How do you know they're out at the far end? He peered through the window. The lake was again shrouded in fog, and there was no sign of campfires. It's so dark, he finished, and turned back to Jaloy. She was certainly not dressed to be out prowling in the woods. Her feet were bare. But even as he looked at her, at the hastily donned robe and the wet beads of mist clinging to her face and hair, he remembered the great wings of the owl who had flown before them to this lake. He could still feel the strong talons that had carried him away when the hateful thing on the road of dreams had been crushing out his life. I, I don't suppose it's important, is it? He finished at last. It's only important that we know they're out there. Despite the faint moonlight, he saw the witch woman grin. Right you are, Simon boy, she said softly, then went to help Binibic fill two more bags, one each for Simon and Maria. Listen, Jaloy said as Simon, now dressed, came over. It is obvious you must get out now, before dawn. She squinted out at the stars for a moment which will not be long in coming. The question is, how? All we can hope, Binibic grunted, is to slip away and try and pass them in the forest, moving with great quietness. We with certainty cannot fly, he grinned somewhat sourly. Maria, bundling into a cloak the Velada had given her, stared at the troll's smile in puzzlement. No, said Jaloy seriously, but I also doubt you could slip by those terrible hounds. You may not fly, but you can float away. I have a boat tied beneath the house. It is not big, but it will hold you all. Kantaka, too, if she does not frolic around. She affectionately ruffled the ears of the wolf who reclined by her squatting master. And of what good is that? Binibic asked. Shall we paddle out to the center of the lake, then in the morning dare them to swim and get us? He finished the last bag and pushed one toward Simon, one toward the girl. There is an inlet stream, Jaloy said. It is small and not very fast flowing, not even as strong as the one you followed on your way here. With four paddles, you can easily make your way out of the lake and up it some ways. Her faint frown was more contemplative than worried. Unfortunately, it also passes by one of the two camps. Well, that is not to be helped. You must simply paddle quietly. Perhaps it will even help in your escape. Such a thick-headed man as your Baron Hayforth, believe me, I have had dealings with him and his like, would not credit that his quarry might slide by so near. Hayforth is not giving me worry, Binibic replied. It is that one who is truly leading the hunt, the Black Rimmersman, Ingen Jaeger. He probably doesn't even sleep, added Simon. He didn't like the memory of that one at all. Jaloy made a wry face. Never fear, then, or at least do not fear, let fear overwhelm you. Some useful distraction or other may occur. One never knows. 
She stood up. Come, boy, she said to Simon. You are good size. Help me untie the boat and move it silently to the front bridge, to the front door bridge. Can you see it? Jaloy hissed, pointing at a dark shape bobbing on the ebony lake near the far corner of the elevated house. Simon, already knee-deep in the water, nodded his head. Go quietly then, she said. Somewhat unnecessarily, Simon thought. As he waded around the side, head high to the cottage's stilted floorboards, Simon decided that he had been mistaken last afternoon when he had felt that somehow things around the hut had changed. That tree there... Sorry, let me reread that sentence. Simon decided that he had not been mistaken last afternoon when he had felt that somehow things around the hut had changed. That tree there, roots halfway into the water. He had seen it the first day they had arrived, but then he was sure by Eusiris it had been on the cottage's other side, near the door plank. How could a tree move? He found the boat's tie rope with his fingers and slid them up until he encountered the place where it was tied to a sort of hoop hanging down from the bottom of the cottage. As he bent down at a back aching angle to try and work the knot loose, he wrinkled his nose against the strange reek. Was it the lake or the underside of the house itself that smelled so? Beside the odor of damp wood and mold, there was also a kind of odd animal scent, warm and musky, but not unpleasant. Even as he squinted into the darkness, the shadows lightened a bit. He could even see the knot. His pleasure at that and the rapid untying that followed was dashed by the cold realization that dawn would be coming soon. The fading darkness was his friend. After pulling the tie line loose, he began wading back toward, began wading back, towing the boat quietly behind him. He could just discern the dim shape of Jaloy standing huddled beside the long plank that sloped from the hut's entrance. The hut's entrance. He headed toward her as quickly as he could until he tripped. With a splash and a muffled cry, he half fell down onto one knee, then drew himself upright. What had caught at him? It felt like a log. He tried to step over the obstruction, but merely succeeded in putting his bare foot down directly on top of it and had to stifle the urge to cry out again. Although it lay unmoving and solid, still it had the scaly feel of one of the pikefish from the, hay the Hayholtz moat or one of the stuffed cockendrills Morganes had kept perched on his shelves. As the ripples quieted, and he heard Jaloy's quiet but wary voice asking if he had hurt himself, he looked down. Although the water was very nearly opaque in the darkness, Simon was sure he could see the outlines of some strange type of log, or rather a vast branch of some kind, for he could see that the thing he had tripped over lying close beneath the surface of the water, joined two other scaly branches. Together they seemed connected to the base of one of the two pillars on which the cottage stood suspended over the lake. And, as he stepped carefully over it, sliding silently through the water toward the shadow that was Jaloy, he suddenly realized that what the tree roots, or branches, or whatever they were, what they truly looked like was some kind of monstrous foot. A claw, actually, the claw of a bird. What a funny idea. A house did not have bird's feet any more than a house got up and walked. Simon was very quiet as Jaloy tied the boat up to the base of the plank. Everything and everybody was packed into the tiny boat. Binibic perched in the pointed bow, Maria in the middle, Simon seated in the stern with a restless kantaka between his knees. The wolf was obviously very uncomfortable. She had whined and resisted when Binibic ordered her into the little craft. He had finally needed to smack her lightly on the snout. The discomfort on the little man's face showed clearly even in the pre-dawn darkness. The moon had swung far into the blue-black vault of the lightning western sky. Jaloy, after handing them the paddles, straightened up. Once you have gotten safely out of the lake, 
and a bit upstream, I think you should probably carry the boat overland through the forest to the Elfwent. It is not a very heavy craft, and you don't need to carry it far. That river is flowing the proper direction and should get you to Dai Chikiza. Binibik reached out with his paddle and pushed the boat away from the plank. Jaloy stood ankle deep at the lake's edge as they spun gently out from the shore. Remember, she whispered, edge those paddles into the water as you reach the inlet stream. Silence, that is your protection. Simon raised his palm. Farewell, Velada Jaloy. Farewell, young pilgrim. Her voice was already growing faint with less than three cubits between them. Good luck to you all. Fear not, I will take good care of the little girl. They slid quietly away until the witch woman was only a shadow beside the house's near stilt. The prow of the little boat cut through the water like a barber's blade through silk. At Binibic's gesture, they lowered their heads, and the troll silently guided the craft toward the center of the misty lake. As Simon huddled into the thick fur of Kantaka's back, feeling the pulse of her nervous breath, he watched tiny rings form on the lake's surface beside the boat. At first, he thought it might be fish up early to break their fast on mayflies and mosquitoes. Then he felt a tiny drop of moisture splash on the back of his neck. And another... It was raining again. As they neared the middle, cutting through swarms of hyacinths that lay scattered on the water before them as though cast in the path of a returning hero, the sky began to brighten. Dawn did not announce its arrival. It would be hours before the sun cut through the clouds and became visible in the sky. Rather, it was as if a layer of darkness had been stripped away from the heavens, the first of many veils. The line of trees that had been a blot of obscurity on the horizon became a thatch of distinguishable treetops profiled against the slate-gray sky. The water was black glass around them, but now some details of the shoreline could be seen. The faint, pale tree roots, like the twisted legs of beggars, the dim silver shine of a granite outcropping, all standing around the secret lake, like a court gallery waiting for the players to arrive, all slowly metamorphosing from gray night shapes to the vivid objects of day. Kantaka hunched, surprised, as Maria suddenly leaned forward to peer over the gunwale of the boat. She started to say something, checked herself, and instead pointed a finger out across the bow and slightly to the right. Simon squinted, then saw it an anomalous shape in the orderless but somehow symmetrical forest fringe, a square, blocky shape that was a different color from the dark branches around it, a striped blue tent. Now they could see several more, a crowd of three or four just behind the first. Simon scowled and smiled disdainfully. How typical of the barren Hayfirth, from what he had heard in his days at the castle anyway, to carry such luxuries out into the wild forest. Just beyond the scatter of small tents, the lake shore dipped back for several ells, then reappeared again, leaving a dark space in the middle as though a bite had been taken from the shoreline. Tree branches hung low over the water there. It was impossible to see if it was truly the river inlet. Um, but Simon felt sure that it was. I'm going to run about two minutes over or so, so just to let you know. Tree branches hung low over the water there. It was impossible to see if it was truly the river inlet, but Simon felt sure that it was. Right where Jaloy said, he thought. Sharp, sharp eyes she's got. But then that's not much of a surprise, is it? He pointed to the dark break in the lake's rim, and Binimic nodded. He had seen it too. As they neared the silent camp, Binimic had to paddle a bit harder to keep them scudding along at a good pace. Simon guessed that they must be starting to feel the push of the feeder stream. He delicately lifted his paddle to lower it over the side. Binibit, catching the movement from the corner of his eye, turned and shook his head, silently mouthing, Not yet. Simon step stopped the small paddle just above the rain-puckered water. 
As they slid past the tents, not thirty ells from the shore, Simon saw a dark shape moving among the walls of azure cloth. His throat tightened. It was a sentry. He could see the dull sheen of metal beneath the cloak. He might even be facing in their direction, but it was difficult to tell, for he had the hood of his cloak up around his head. Within instants, the other... The, within instants, the others had also seen the man. Benedict slowly lifted his paddle from the water, and they all leaned forward, hoping to show as little profile as possible. Even if the soldier chanced to look out onto the lake, perhaps his eye would pass over them or see only a log bobbing on the water. But that was really too much to hope for, Simon felt sure. He could not imagine the man failing to spot them if he turned, close as they were. Even as the progress of the little craft slowed, the dark gap in the shoreline came up before them. It was the inlet stream. Simon could see the water rip rippling faintly where it passed over the rounded back of a stone some few yards up the channel. It had also nearly stopped their forward motion. As a matter of fact, the nose of the boat was beginning to come around, rebuffed by the mild current. They would have to put paddles in the water soon or be pushed into the bank just below the blue tents. Then, finished with whatever had caught his attention at the far side of the camp, the sentry turned around to gaze out across the lake. Within an instant, even before the mounting fear could truly take hold of them, a dark shape dropped from the trees over the camp and skimmed swiftly toward the sentry. It sailed through the branches like a huge gray leaf and fetched up against his neck, but this leaf had talons. When he felt them at his throat, the armored man gave a shout of horror and dropped his spear, beating at whatever had clutched him. The gray shape fluttered up, wings churning, and hung his head, hung over his head just beyond his reach. He shouted again, clutching his neck, and fumbled in the dirt for his spear. Now, Benebic hissed, paddle! He and Maria and Simon drove the wooden blades into the water, pulling desperately. For the first few strokes, they seemed somehow snagged, water splashing purposelessly as the boat rocked. Then they began to ease forward, and within moments were pushing against the stronger current of the stream, sliding in beneath the overarching branches. Simon looked back to see the sentry, head bare, leaping up and down, trying to swat the hovering creature. A few of the other men sat up from their bedrolls, beginning to laugh now as they watched their comrade who had dropped his spear and was now throwing rocks at this daft, dangerous bird. The owl dodged the missiles with ease. As Simon lowered the curtain of leafy branches down behind the boat, it gave a flirt of its wide white tail and circled up into the shadowed trees. As they strained forward against the difficult current, surprisingly difficult since on the surface it did not appear to be moving at all, Simon gave a quiet chortle of triumph. And that's where we're stopping. And apparently I was wrong about tonight being daylight savings. It's a good thing that I'm not in charge of the world. That's all I have to say because it says here it's 2 o'clock on my thing. So I guess it's next week. Ah, oh, well. Doesn't matter. Um, it's all the same. It's all the same. And then I'll be doing this again next week, I guess. So you know, maybe I'll get it right next time. I'll just keep calling every weekend daylight savings and eventually I'll be right because a stopped clock is right once a year <laughs> on daylight savings. I don't know. Um, anyway, with that, I will thank you for joining me. It is now four minutes after two of a non- daylight savings or still daylight savings night morning whatever it is so i wish you all well i hope you will take good care of yourselves your loved ones your friends anybody around you neighbors uh people who happen to need some help please try and give it to them i appreciate your company i appreciate being able to share with you and i will be returning of course 7 p.m to read again for whoever happens to be available at that time of the day slash night. Um, for those of you not, of course, you can find these readings on Chris Fab's uh, YouTube channel or on my social media. And with that, I will say 
Ciao, Bambini. Lovely to see you. See you real soon, one way or the other, either later today or next week. And y'all be good. Peace. Good night.